We're very pleased to have everyone with us, and we're especially grateful for the visitors who've come our way. You're a welcome guest, and we certainly want you to know if you have any questions about what we believe and practice, then we'll do our best to give you a biblical answer for that. We, as the Church of Christ, simply are trying to be what you read of in your New Testament. We're not interested in trying to be a denomination. We can't find those in the New Testament, at least where they're condoned and recommended. We're interested in following the divine infallible pattern or the New Testament blueprint for having the Lord's church as it was 2,000 years ago. Now, the reason for that is that's the way that's right and can't be wrong. We're not interested in going against the authority of Jesus Christ as he manifests it in his inspired word. We constantly remind ourselves that whatsoever we do in word or in deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father by Him, Colossians 3.17. If what you believe today concerning what Jesus wants you to do to be saved and be faithful is taught in the Scriptures, you don't need to change. If in reviewing your life in all honesty before God, you find that things that you're believing and doing is contrary to the last will and testament of Jesus Christ, then we would urge you to change. Because that's what Christ came to get people to do, is to change, to follow His will, and be saved thereby. We've been engaged for quite a few weeks in a series of studies that we're calling the Word of Reconciliation. Each one of these lessons is designed to stand on its own. And yet they're all connected. And those who followed with us can realize that they think about it, they're all connected. Because it's designed to help a person who's trying to understand in this mess that religion is in today just what pure, primitive, New Testament Christianity actually is. And what we're actually doing as we go through the study of the Word of Reconciliation is actually unfolding the book of Acts and understanding how the church, after its establishment in Acts chapter 2 on the day of Pentecost following the resurrection of Christ, went out carrying out the great commission which our Lord had given the church, and He's still given it to us as our responsibility. Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. Mark 16, 15, and 16. We see how the church first began to spread, and we see people... Hearing the word of God, the gospel of Christ, which Paul said is God's power to save us, Romans 1.16. As it was heralded throughout that land and those regions so many, many years before. I want to read to you again why we're calling this the word of reconciliation. It comes from the pen of the great apostle Paul in his writing of the second letter to the church in Corinth. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, we read beginning in verse 18. And all things are of God who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ and hath given unto us the ministry of reconciliation. He's speaking, of course, of the word of the apostles who are the ambassadors of the court of heaven. That is, by the Holy Spirit, they were miraculously guided to set out the will of heaven. And, of course, they are then having the power that any ambassador from any nation on this earth would have to officially represent to another nation the position. In this case, King Jesus is revealing through the apostles and prophets what we have is the New Testament. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished into all good works. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. So he says, to wit that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing or reckoning their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us, originally the apostles, the word of reconciliation. And then he says, Now then we are ambassadors for Christ, the apostles of Christ, as though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead, be you reconciled to God. The plea of the Lord's people from that time to this and for faithful churches of our Lord until the end of time will be that 
men be reconciled to God. And the only way that that's possible, through the word of reconciliation. And that's why Paul told Timothy, preach the word. Be instant in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. So we want to emphasize uh, in this particular lesson, the word of reconciliation reaches Samaria. I go back for a moment to point out that that portion of the land of Canaan, Samaria, when the children of Israel came to take up their abode there, fell to the lot of what we know as the ten northern tribes the two southern tribes that would make up later on in the divided kingdom, the kingdom of Judah, would be Judah and Benjamin. Here they lived as a part of the united kingdom of Israel under the judges and then under, in the united kingdom, David, Solomon, and before that the first one, Saul. Each one ruling, Saul, David, and Solomon, 40 years. And they stayed in that land, counting the United Kingdom plus the divided kingdom, for about 470 years. The son of Solomon, Rehoboam, rashly took the advice of the young men rather than the wise and older men who had recommended that if you're going to make this kingdom be what it ought to be, then you need to lighten the burdens of the people because Solomon had taxed them severely. That's what the elderly men said. But the younger men, his own age, told him, no, just pile it on them a lot more. And so he responded by saying, if you thought daddy was tough, just sit by and watch what I'm going to be. And therefore the kingdom divided. And the northern kingdom of Israel came into being with the ten tribes I mentioned a moment ago. And a fellow by the name of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, became the first king of the northern kingdom. And here they lived under various kings. Most all of those kings were very wicked people. They lived there about 235 years. At the end, toward the close of this time period, when Hoshea was king, Scripture tells us that the king of Assyria came up throughout all the land and went up to Samaria and besieged it three years. Well, the siege was successful. And Samaria was subdued by the Assyrians and was carried into what we know as the Assyrian captivity. Well, in those days, those eastern countries tended to depopulate the countries that they conquered. And they would take the best they had back and incorporate them into their own countries. So now Samaria has been depopulated. The king of Assyria then sent men from a number of different provinces in its kingdom, from its own country and different countries, and colonized the area of Samaria. These, of course, colonists, if you'll call them that, were idolaters. They were pagans. and They worshipped various images and various gods of their own making. These they had, of course, worshipped back in their former homes. They hadn't been there long until they got into trouble. And while the children of Israel had been carried off because of their unfaithfulness to God, that's the whole reason it happened, still these were trespassers in a land God had given to His own peculiar people. So here's what the Scripture said. The Lord sent lions among them which slew some of them. Well, these people believed there were God's many, that each country had a God that looked after the well-being of that specific uh, people, or those specific peoples of that country. They thought the trouble, if you read the text that they were in, came as a result of them not knowing the gods of that particular part of the land. Well, hearing of the trouble, then the king of Assyria sent some of the priests he had carried away captive that they might teach them the manner of the God of this land. And these priests came back from captivity to Samaria and taught them, at least partially, and I have to underscore partially, the law of Moses. And they began to worship according to its requirements, somewhat at least, yet they continued to serve their graven images. 
Now, if you want to read specifically this whole history, just go to 2 Kings chapter 17, 2 Kings 17, and you can find out all about this in the divine volume. Well, here was the beginning, because I have entitled this, The Word of Reconciliation Reaches Samaria. In other words, saying the gospel of Christ reaches Samaria. This was the beginning of a mongrel religion and a mongrel people that existed in very large numbers some 700 years afterwards when Jesus in the flesh walked this earth. Well, remarkable it is to relate this. We see a small remnant still live there even to this day. You don't hear about them any, but they still go up on Mount Gerizim and they offer worship according to the Samaritans. They're very few in number, but they're there. And they were there during the lifetime of our Lord on this earth. And they observed many of the rites, but they are contrary to the law, even as they were when the law of Moses was still for the Jews. Jesus even told them that salvation is the Jews when he met with the Samaritan woman there in Samaria while he was on this earth. When Jesus sent the twelve on their limited commission, he said that they were to go into the city of the Samaritans, that is, they were not to go into the cities of the Samaritans, but they were to go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. They weren't even to go to the Gentiles, non-Jews. But now, after his death and resurrection and ascension, and after committing the word of reconciliation, and the church was begun in Acts 2, and that word of reconciliation, the gospel had worldwide application, as it does even to this day. Here is exactly what he said. He said, Ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. Acts 1 and verse 8. Now, if you read through the book of Acts, as I hope you will if you haven't, you'll see that the early church and spreading of the gospel followed that plan. They first, where the church was established, preached the gospel all around Jerusalem, then Judea, which is where Jerusalem's found. And then they went to Samaria, and from there they spread throughout the whole world. This also shows us their concern to follow very closely with what the Word of God said, to be sure they were pleasing to their God. Now here, at this time, the human race was divided into three classes. And I make the Samaritans the third class because we all know there's Jews and Gentiles, Gentiles and non-Jews. But there were the Samaritans, as we've just noticed. They would be considered a part of the Gentile world by the Jews. But nevertheless, they weren't true Gentiles as a Greek or a Roman might be. The word of reconciliation was to be carried to everybody. And so they set about to do it. And they carried it out, I remind you, according to the order that we just read. The work began in Jerusalem, and its life-giving message reached Samaria by the mouth of the evangelist Philip. The history of the conversion of the Samaritans, and it's a very interesting one, is found in the 8th chapter of the book of Acts, the book of conversions in the history of the early church from his establishment the first several years after its existence in preaching the gospel and showing various cases of conversions in the process of preaching. Let me remind you that Philip himself was not one of the apostles to whom was committed originally the word of, recon the word of reconciliation. The early church understood how the Lord was putting his will on this earth. In Acts 2, in verse 42, as the church was established, <clears throat> People had heard the word, they'd believed it, they'd been baptized for the remission of their sins. The Lord had added them to His church. And we find that the church, striving to do only what the Lord said, not having a completed written down New Testament, that they understood if we're to follow the Lord, we must listen to His divine ambassadors, the ambassadors of the court of heaven, to earth. And that was the apostles of Jesus Christ. And we find that the church understood this because Acts 2.42, the inspired Luke who made the record said, and they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. But we see that Philip then was one we would call one of the early evangelists. 
And it was common, uh, in common with others of his time. And remember, they had no New Testament. It hasn't been revealed yet. Well, how are they to live the Christian life? They had direct guidance of the Holy Spirit. And he had the power to prove that what he was saying was from heaven and not from men because he could confirm it by miracles, signs, and wonders that he did. And that tells us again, as we studied earlier, about the design and purpose and the end of miracles. So he had the gifts of the Spirit. And we learn from Paul's own writing in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 12 the purpose of those gifts in view of the fact they had no completed New Testament. It says they were for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying, building up spiritually, of the body of Christ. Ephesians 4 and verse number 12. Now this class of preachers, no doubt, were so guided by the Spirit, as we pointed out, that they taught the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Yet they had learned much of what they studied, what they preached from the apostles themselves. I know that because what Paul said to the young preacher Timothy in 2 Timothy 2 and verse 2, the things that thou have heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men, who shall be able to teach others also. And yet, they were human. They had the same fallibleness that we do. They were not infinite. They were finite. They had their human frailties. Well, how in the world are you going to get a perfect law without it being tainted into a world like this through men like this? And that's why you had the work of the third person of the Godhead, of the Holy Spirit, baptizing the apostles with the baptismal measure of power of the Holy Spirit, and the apostles laying hands and conferring miraculous gifts on others in the church. There were nine of those gifts. You can read of them in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, where he corrects the abuse of those gifts. That is, the apostle Paul does. But you see the design and purpose of those miracles. Now, this extension of the word of reconciliation to Samaria, I guess you could say speaking according to modern terminology or parlance, was the first real missionary, the way we use it today, work of the church. It wasn't necessarily the result of an organized effort, though there's nothing wrong with the church planning, purposing to organize and go to a specific place in the world that needs the gospel, but this one wasn't. In fact, it was the, it was the result of a disorganizing effort on the part of unbelieving Jews in Jerusalem because the reason they left Jerusalem was they were being persecuted. Following the death of Stephen, the first Christian martyr, and the building persecution led by one Saul of Tarsus, then they were scattered, the scripture says, everywhere and wherever they went, they preached the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now that tells you something about their conviction and their courage and their great faith in God through the gospel. They are having to leave town and home because they were Christians and because of the message preached. Yet, they continued to preach it. And that's because of a great belief that it's the Word of God. Jesus had said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes with the Father but by me, John 14, 6. They understood that. They understood that it was in the glad tidings of Christ, the gospel of Christ, that salvation from God through Christ is offered and from no other source. I remember, and I've related this at times before, you may or may not remember it, some of you haven't heard it, but one time in Singapore, in preaching, the cab driver who was taking us from one place to another, several preachers in the cab, thought he would chime in, I guess, because we found out we were preachers, and begin to say, well, it's nice and wonderful that we can all approach God in our own various ways, and uh, we all serve Him whatever. And, uh, you know, you don't have a lot of time to preach in a cab. And I just spoke up and said, well, what about this? Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me, John 14, 6. He didn't say anything else. Wish he had. Wish he had enough interest to say, well, that sheds a little different light on the subject. It's not many ways to heaven. Jesus said there's one way. It's through him and it's through his gospel. The early church understood that. Even so much when they were persecuted in Jerusalem, it drove them out of the city. They still preached the very thing that brought persecution down upon them. That takes great faith, courage, and conviction to do that. 
And it's highly needed among those who are truly New Testament Christians today. These early preachers of the gospel, these early evangelists, were not sent by the church, but when as a result then of this persecution, that as I said, came after the death and because of the death of, of Stephen, they had the zeal even that Christ had, and that's something his spiritual body, the church, needs today to have that concern for lost souls. For we are commissioned as the church to preach the gospel to every creature. Preaching the gospel is not an official work belonging to a select class that today and for many years has been called the clergy. You can't find that in the Bible. It doesn't exist. It is the prerogative of everyone who has heard Jesus say in the gospel, Come to me all you that labor and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest for your soul. And there toward the end, before the pen of inspiration is laid down forevermore, John in Revelation 22, 17, has Jesus saying, Come. And those who have come, believed and obeyed the gospel and been baptized in the Christ, every single solitary one of them, according to their several ability under the authority of Christ, every member of the church is obligated to teach others the gospel of Christ. There is no clergy laity system in the Lord's church. Everybody or members in particular, each according to their own several abilities, striving to serve the Lord and preach the gospel as good stewards of the Lord's will and living it out in their daily lives. J.W. McGarvey, in his commentary, speaking of the scattering of the disciples because of persecution and their preaching, has this to say. The result was the rapid spread of the gospel into the cities of Judea and even unto Samaria. Thus, the apparent ruin of the single church in Jerusalem resulted in the springing up of many churches throughout the province, proving for the thousandth time in the world's history how impotent is the hand of man when fighting against God. As the blows from the blacksmith's hammer on the heated iron scatter the scintillations in every direction, so the effort of the wicked Jews to crush the church of Christ only scattered its light more widely abroad. It's very interesting that they were under the Great Commission. They knew Christ had told the apostles what he did, and it was a command to preach the gospel to every creature. But they weren't going. They were staying. And even God, through the unbelieving Jews, persecution of the church, and scattering them because of that persecution, used it to get the gospel out to a lost and dying world. There may be a message in that for us, brethren. Guided by then a divine providence, we find that Philip went down to Samaria. Now it's important to realize that when you read about the geography, and that being inspired word of God, and it mentions geography, and it says up and it says down, then it means up and down. Everything from Jerusalem is down because it's so far up. And so the scripture's right when it says Philip went down to Samaria. That's about 40 some odd miles uh, northwest from Jerusalem. Much more hilly country there, although it's lower than Jerusalem. And the scripture indicates that he went there following that persecution, being some of those who were scattered, and preached Christ unto them. As already stated, he was not an apostle. But he carried with him, as every faithful member of the church does, that word of reconciliation. Well, how do you carry it with you? Well, everybody understood what Paul wrote later. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. 2 Timothy 2 and verse 15. There's no way that you can read the New Testament, especially the book of Acts, and not see that the church is fundamentally and primarily a teaching institution. It is the work of the spiritual body of Christ, the Lord's church, the kingdom of heaven, the family of God, to preach the truth to a lost and dying world, the world lost in sin. And this word of reconciliation is what reconciles lost men to God through their belief in it, obedience to the gospel, and being saved from their sins. They are saved to save others. So they preach the same 
powerful gospels. Wherever they went, in this case Samaria, that had first been preached in Jerusalem. The Samaritans at this time were under the influence, and Luke tells us about this, of a fellow by the name of Simon. And because of his actions, it was given out, as the Scripture says, that he himself was some great one. You know, there's always people like that around. You know, the world's never going to be free of those folks who give out about themselves that they're some great one. Just turn on your television, and people will tell you how great they are. So it's nothing new. In fact, he had so bewitched them with sorceries. He was a mighty good magician. He had done well in Las Vegas. And more ways than one in Las Vegas, that they had come to regard him because you're dealing with a very pagan-minded people as the great power of God. To a people thus bewitched and bewildered came the evangelist Philip with the word of reconciliation and the gospel of Jesus Christ. The scripture says he began to preach Christ. Now that's a good way to put it. When you preach the New Testament system, when you preach the plan of salvation, when you preach the church and its work, its organization and its mission, and when you preach while Christians are to live in that church, that's what it means to preach Christ. Grammatically, it's simply a synecdoche. In the English language, it means where a part stands for the whole or a whole for the part. In this case, to preach Christ, to preach the whole counsel of God, as Paul said that he preached in Acts 20 to the church in Ephesus. Now, as in the case of the apostles, God worked with him and confirmed the word, proving it to be from heaven and not from men, by the signs following. The scripture says, For unclean spirits, crying with loud voice, came out of many that were possessed of them, and many taken with palsies, and they that were lame were healed. Acts 8, 7. This reminds us again of the design and purpose of miracles. People many times today like to claim their miracles being done as Jesus did in the apostles. And as Philip did. As one who had received the laying on of hands. And having thereby conferred upon him the powers to work miracles. But they don't even have the reason that miracles existed in those days. There is no new revelation from God today. Men may claim it, but there is none. If you ever noticed, I remember back in the 60s when they developed the hotline between the president's office and Moscow. The idea was that, well, if they can talk directly to one another in a time of crisis, they can, they can ward off problems that they might not be able to otherwise. And the hotline was used many times. Well, there are people today who say they got a hotline to God. Uh, they can tell you, and there are those this morning who are glad to tell you that God told them something last night or an angel spoke to them. All you have to do is read part of the word of reconciliation in Galatians 1 to hear Paul say, though we are an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel to you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. As we said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel to you than that which has been preached to you, let him be accursed. We have the full, complete gospel of Christ, the New Testament, and there's not going to be any more. Jesus said concerning the day of judgment, He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words hath one that judgeth him. The word that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. John 12, 48. We have the totality of truth necessary for man's salvation in this one divine volume, the Bible, specifically the New Testament of Christ for us today. For Jesus said, All authority hath been given unto me in heaven and on earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Matthew 28, 18, verses following. And thus we have the will of Christ. In the words of Christ, that word of reconciliation, the gospel of Christ of which Paul said, I am not ashamed. Because it's the power of God to save. God could save us any way He chose, but which way did He choose? He placed His power to save us from sin in the glad tidings of Christ. That's what the gospel means. You can read of it in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 1 through 4. The fundamentals of it are the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Christ. So the truth of the doctrine of Christ, the faith, 
is set out in the New Testament system. But concerning this man, and the people with one accord gave heed to those things which Philip spake. Why did they do it? Listen to the rest of this. Hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. They listened to what he said. They understood the words. They paid attention to the message. Why? They learned it was from heaven and not from men. How? By the miracles, signs, and wonders he did that no normal man could do by human power. That signal to them, pay attention to the message. Well, today, those that tend to claim miracles, first of all, couldn't produce a one that you read of in the Scriptures. Next of all, they're emphasizing the miracles they do. But in those days, when the Spirit actually enabled men to work miracles, it proved that you better listen to the message and make sure that you're in harmony with it in the way you live. As a result of this, they turned away from the sorcerer. And the Scripture says in verse 12, But when they believed Philip preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name or the authority of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. And so it's ever been when people have truly become simply Christians. Nothing more, nothing less, nothing else. Members of the church that Jesus built, that he purchased with his blood, that started in Jerusalem so long ago. Today we know of these things in the same way that the Samaritans came to know of them. By the word of reconciliation. The word I preach this day. How plain and simple this narrative is. And how easy to be understood. And when you put aside the preconceived notions and thousands of years of false doctrine, Christianity is very simple, very easily understood. So why not be desirous of being what they were then, 1,500 years before there was ever one denomination, hundreds of years before there ever was a Roman Catholicism. When you pick up your Bible, and the Bible only, and you study it, handling it correctly, it does, it's not hard to see that Jesus exercises His authority and extends His salvation as the way, the truth, and the life through the precious and wonderful gospel of Christ. It's untainted. It's pure. It's still there. It's still the seed of the kingdom. Luke 8, 11, the word of God. If we will sow that seed, that is, if we will teach what they taught that's in our New Testaments today, we'll be what they were. And we'll rest assured we're fully acceptable to God in the church that Jesus built. But when we obey the gospel, as they did on the day it started, the Lord added them to the church. And we'll be able to fellowship and associate and work with all those who heard the same gospel, believed it, from the heart obeyed it. As Paul reminded the church at Rome to exhort them to greater service, that God be thanked that you were the servants of sin, but you have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered to you. Being then made free from sin, ye became the servants of righteousness. And that's what will happen to anybody who follows a simple and powerful gospel message in full belief and obedience. Attention has heretofore been called to the fact that the writer of Acts does not give all the cases of reconciliation with the same minuteness that he does in those that are recorded therein, and even some of them much more detailed than others. Here it's expressly stated that Christ was preached People believe the message and that in obedience to the message to fulfill the requirements of the word of reconciliation, to have the forgiveness of sins, to be saved by the blood of Christ, they were baptized into Christ for the remission of sins. Galatians 3, 26 and 27. And so it is that the demarcation point from a life of sin and the curse of sin to one of salvation is when one is baptized in Christ for the remission of sin. Now I know there's a multiplicity of people claiming to be Christians. And they teach you don't have to be baptized to be saved. And they give out that they themselves are some great people. And they have great influence among the people. Beloved, this book right here will dissolve any false doctrine on the face of this earth. And it's full of material saying that the false teachers will come. And the false teachers will teach. Over and over again, Jesus and others said, Be not deceived. 
over and over again, they said that false teachers would come, not announcing they were false teachers, and if you believed them, you'd lose your soul, but they would be as wolves in sheep's clothing. The work of a false teacher is to deceive. Now, how do I know? Whether a person's right or a person's wrong. You can't unless you study the Scriptures for yourself. Now, you say, but you preach the truth. Can I understand that way? Yes, you can. But if you don't have enough interest to sit down and study the Word of your God on your own and learn how to study it, what does that say about your own concern for God in your life? The reason people are what God intends for them to be is because they hunger and thirst after righteousness. Now, I know what it means to hunger and thirst after regular food, and you do too. Do we have the same desire to know the Word of God and put it to practice? <coughs> Jesus pronounced the blessing only on those who hunger and thirst. He says that class of people will be filled, Matthew 5. So we're asking you, to exercise your desire to know the truth and check me out everything I say to see if I gave you the pure word of God and to daily search the scriptures in them you think you have eternal life and they are they that testify of our Lord. Do you hunger and thirst after righteousness? To become a Christian you must believe on the basis of the teaching of the Bible that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Following that, you must repent of your sins, Acts 17, 30. You must confess your faith in Christ, Romans 10, 10. And you must complete your obedience to the gospel to become a Christian by being baptized for the remission of sins. If you haven't done that, you're not reconciled to God. You're outside of Christ. You're lost. And yet Jesus still says, Come unto me, all you that labor, heavy laden. I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest under your soul. Well, you do that by hearing, believing, and obeying the gospel, and then as a Christian in the Lord's church, with others who've done likewise, you serve Him faithfully till time is no more. The Lord's coming back someday to judge the world. Don't know when that's going to be. But we know this, it's appointed unto men once to die, and after that the judgment. Now we prepare to meet the Lord once we die, because that's coming, and following that is the judgment, where we shall give an account of the deeds done in the body while we were here, to the Lord in the light of the divine standard of the New Testament system. If as a child of God you sin, we urge you to repent, come confessing those sins and praying God for forgiveness, for that's God's second law of, of pardon for the member of the Lord's church. Are you subject to the will of Christ? He loves you. He wants you to become a Christian. There's only one way to do it, and that's His way. And I have no authority to alter that, to compromise it, to water it down, to fit anybody's desires. Without apology, then, I offer you the great invitation of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, while we stand and sing. <laughs>